Welcome to Miss V, the Storyteller Podcast. You guys, you know, I have always searched for the best people to bring to the show. And I am so thrilled today to have Miss Cynthia Sperling. Did I say it right? Yes. Oh, cool. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You all know I, I, I'm working on those names. Y'all pray for me. Anyway, <laughs> I am so thrilled to have her, you know. Um, as you all know, we have our meet and greets and when her and I were talking, um, I really, uh, it was some things about her. I was like, you know what? I think she's really going to bring it on the show. So I try to bring you guys the best. So with that said, Cynthia, please share with us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, sure. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm really excited to chat with you and share with your audience. My background is communications. I've always, always been involved in sharing ideas and information with people. And so I work in real estate as an entrepreneur, specifically in um, creative real estate investing. So I started off in pre-foreclosure investing. And since like I was a kid, I love, love, love real estate. And then I eventually wanted to do something safer as I got older. And so now I work with women and teach them how to invest, whether their credit is A1 or their savings are top of the heap, whatever their dollar amount, I help them invest in tax liens and tax deeds. Great. Ooh, I love that. Don't you guys love to see a woman doing this? I <laughs> love it. And I am sure she just slays it because when we make up our minds to do something, we do it to the fullest. So I know that when you're out there, you're like, I'm going to slay this, which is so <laughs> awesome. So as you know, um, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that normally we talk about one of my stories and then my guest shares their story. Well, like I said, I'm changing things up a little bit. What I'm having my guests to do is to share their story. So we're going to hear about them. And then I'll share a little bit of story, a little bit of my story with you all. So Cynthia, share with us your story. Well, my story is about the beauty of entrepreneurship is being able to work when and where you want to. And so as an entrepreneur, when the call came to help my parents uh, a few years ago, I was able to unplug from my business and help my parents 100%. So I notified my clients. Uh, I have a tax lien mastermind. I let them know that there was a change in my family and they all heard stories about my parents because they're my inspiration. And so they said, we understand Cynthia. So take care of your family. We know how important that is to you. And it was just a beautiful experience to have that relationship with my clients and then to be able to work with my parents without a second thought. So basically, um, my mother had been very well, so healthy her whole life. She said that she had went to Dr. Jesus. So mm. she, <laughs> she barely had a cold her whole life. And so she took care of our family. She had a daycare, her own business. She ran for nearly 40 years. The, such a good service that the children brought their children to her in oh, later wow. years. So it was a phenomenal family affair. And I helped my mom in the business as I went up through elementary school and high school through college. And so I learned a lot about business from helping my parents in their business. But uh, my mom became the caretaker eventually of my father, who was suffering from dementia and uh, blindness. And so they were doing well together in the home that they had bought 60 years ago. And they were really in control. And I would help them. Once a month, I'd come down, I was living in Vegas, and I'd come down to LA and, and work with them and spend time with them here at the house. And I'd say to them, what's the plan? What's going to happen? And they'd say, we haven't decided yet. I'm like, you're 80. You haven't decided yet? <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? So long story short, one day my mom called and she said, hey, um, your dad's not doing well. They're hospitalizing him for a heart issue. And would you come home? So I flew home immediately. And that was the beginning of the decline. And so it was apparent with my father first, but he did recover from the heart issue and he was back to normal again. So a few months later, I came home and my mother was really tired 
And mm -hmm. she had lost her brother. So I thought, oh, maybe she's grieving. So I'll stay a little longer than I normally do this visit. And that turned into a week, turned into two weeks. And I said, mom, something's really wrong. This isn't like you. Mm -hmm. So months passed. It was difficult after COVID to get doctor's appointments. So finally, I said, mom, let's go to the ER and we can get some answers at the ER. She says, oh, I don't want to go to the ER. They're going to keep me. I mm -hmm. said, mom, if they keep you, it's because you, you need their help. And so the last day, she put it off every day. Tomorrow, I'm going to be better. So finally, yeah. it was Good Friday. And I said, mom, we can't wait anymore. And so she got up and she started doing dishes. We didn't have a dishwasher. She was from the Louisiana and didn't want any of those modern contraptions. Yes, yes. So <laughs> she loved, that was a time for her to think when she was doing the dishes. So I said, mom, I don't care what you do, we're going. So she washed that last glass and we went to the ER and they took us right away. And um, her vitals were great. And so um, they said, see mom, it's okay. A few more tests and we'll be home. And we had left my dad at home uh, sleeping. So, uh, but he knew we were gone if he remembered. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, he usually slept that time of the morning. So it was fine. So anyway, um, we went into the behind the scenes into a, a room assigned at the ER. And that's when they started putting an EKG mm -hmm. monitor on her. And that's when they first saw the problem. They said, oh, your blood pressure, your heartbeat is racing. And so they tried to bring it under control, but they couldn't. And so they said, we're going to have to admit her. So I went home. I left my mom and I went home and got my dad. And we came back to the hospital and they had assigned her to a room. And um, of the arrhythmia, they, they started doing tests. And so long story short, uh, we had Easter dinner. We had planned to have honey baked ham, our usual uh, Easter mm -hmm. family favorite, and my mom's homemade potato salad that's yes. to be so delicious. Yes. All that kind of stuff we were planning on that day. So I packed it up and I took it to the hospital, and we had Aww. Easter um, dinner at the hospital that's so that sweet. year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so sweet. And, <laughs> yeah, it was really great. But uh, the sad part was, um, you know, none of the staff could enjoy it because of COVID. No one could, you know, share food or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But they were happy to see us happy and, and having a little family time. And so, um, so after the holiday, they had run some tests and they didn't look good during that Saturday before Easter. The doctor was concerned, but, and the nurses could see the report already, but they wouldn't say it's not their place. But, um, you know, it, just their conversation didn't sound very good. So when I tried every day to get the doctor on the phone, I'd le tell every nurse, please, 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 mm -hmm. you know, um, ask the doctor to call me. And uh, they didn't. <laughs> Maybe they did. I don't know. But the doctor never called me until after she spoke with my mother. And my mother was the type of person, the reason I was so anxious to speak to the doctor first was because my mother learned and believed a lot of what she heard. Okay. And so she was a hearing person. Okay. And she loved stories. So mm -hmm. she would love this podcast you have. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so long story short, uh, the doctor said that my mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer oh, and no. there were tumors in her back and in her spine. And so how they found it, they were, they did a CAT scan uh -huh. and the CAT scan revealed some spots and so they couldn't tell what it was. So they said, let's do an MRI. And with the MRI mm. was very clear yeah. and it showed that there were uh, whatever, they never found where the source of the cancer was because she was so advanced and so uncomfortable that she couldn't sit through the tests. Uh, but they could see the tumors in her spine and it was stage four. So um, they gave her six months to live. Oh, that is, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Uh, um, I, I want you to finish the story, but I, to me, when you said about your mom kept putting it off and putting it off, my mom, the same way. I'm all right. It's okay. <laughs> I'm gonna be all right, girl. Just, it, it'll be all right. I just need to get yeah. some rest. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how they do that, but go ahead and finish your story. 
Yeah, so she was pretty remarkable, very strong minded person. Um, and so after the doctor told her she was really strong, I wasn't there. The doctor called me at home while I was with my father. And so um, I said to the nurse when I came to the hospital that day, I, I said, um, they said, my mom is diagnosed with cancer. She said, yes. She said, your mom was so strong when the doctor told her the news. She said, thank you, doctor. She said, I've had a good life. And that was it. Oh, I like your mom. <laughs> Even if with bad news, she felt mm -hmm. she was still positive. I love yeah. that. Yeah. 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 She, she had one. Well, of course, my dad was her partner through life, but her entire life, she really had a strong faith in God. Mm -hmm. And so she wasn't afraid because she knew she had lived right and she had done well. And um, so. I know. I know. I know. I know. You can so, take your time. Take your time <laughs> if you need to, because when you talk about your parents, it hits you in your heart, especially yeah. if you're close. So I, I I understand it. I get it. Yeah. We look, we get it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So so anyway, the interesting thing was uh she believed that she couldn't go home. She had a mobility issue with her leg. And so sometimes her knee didn't work very well. And that's how she started to suspect she had cancer was because uh, she always got this shot in her knee to help solve mm. the pain. Uh, she didn't want to have the knee replacement because she'd have to leave my dad. And that was like, no, that's I'm not, not going to happen. That. Uh -uh, no, <laughs> that was her boo thing. I am not leaving my boo thing. <laughs> no way, no way. So so she endured that pain for many years because she did have arthritis, but what could you do? And that's what she thought the pain in her back was, was arthritis. She was making breakfast for my dad, dinner, doing the laundry, taking care of the house, everything. So, and she's just like going, she had a walker to help her. All right. So we went, um, so she said, you know, my leg is really bothering me, but they have a physical therapist coming. And if I don't walk, um, they're not going to let me leave the hospital. She mm -hmm. had just made this up in her mind. They never told her that. So the therapist gave her a walk around and they said, okay, we'll discharge you. And um, and so she came home and she walked in the house. And then two days later, she stood up and in the morning out of after sleeping and she said, Cynthia, Cynthia. And I said, what's going on? I ran to the room and she says, I can't move. I said, but you're standing. Yeah. And she says, I can't move my leg. So something had happened with the with one of those tumors. It must have grown or changed positions on her um, nerve. I don't yeah. 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 So she couldn't walk. She literally could not walk. And I called my uncle and he came and brought a wheelchair uh, because she couldn't walk anymore. And but she had believed that if she didn't walk, that she couldn't leave the hospital and she was not staying in that hospital any longer. So she she was able to walk long enough. That's how strong the mind is. She was able to walk until she came home. And then after that, my dad couldn't believe that uh, she couldn't walk anymore. And so, um, you know, he said, I hear you. I hear you. Because he couldn't see. I said, no, it's me. I'm walking. <laughs> I'm walking. <laughs> not mom so anyway we had a lot of laughs and so that was the magic of that time that we were able to spend some quality quality time because it's different when you know someone's older like mm -hmm. oh my mom's 60 she's 70 she's 80 85 and you're just you always think there's more time yeah. but when you know there's no more time this is it so she'd wake up in the middle of the night at two in the morning, four in the morning. And um, she loved to play the gospel music. So on the BET gospel, we'd leave, mm -hmm. we'd leave that plan through the night. So if she woke up, that would entertain her and comfort her. But uh, she'd call for help and I'd go and we would talk. And I, if it was two o'clock and she'd say, oh, go back to bed. I'd say, no, 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 this is our time. Yeah. So yeah. we're just going to talk. And and then, you know, she'd kind of settle down a little bit. The pain would subside and then we'd go back to bed. But we'd listen to the gospel music or we'd talk about things from the past. And my whole thing in telling this story and, um, you know, possibly writing a book 
is that to prepare to anticipate that it's not may not be your story, but if it the time should come and it goes that way, that you can uh, consider what would you do if you needed to care for your parents, you know, um, yeah. with no warning. Sometimes it, it's a stroke, and sometimes it's something like you're given a finite time, like six months, but we made the most of the time. And I hope that other people can have that same thing. So when my mom, her instruction was to go back to her physician and give them the update at the ER. And so her doctor was so sad. She felt that she had let my mom down, um, that she had not found this, you know, issue in her health. And my mom wrote her a letter and she told her that um, it was her way, that it was private, you know, the way she grew up at her time, that health was a private matter, even from your doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so when my mom went to the doctor for years and years, a sweet lady was her doctor. She would just talk to her about her life. She'd say, so tell me, are you married? Are you, who are you, you're dating? And yeah. she knew everything about that lady, how many siblings she had, <laughs> how old her mother and father were, her grandmother was alive, everything about this lady. So the lady was really loved my mom. And then she would tell her what was wrong with my dad. And she'd say, now you check this on him. You check this on him, but I'm fine. You don't have to worry about me. I love your mom. <laughs> oh my God. I love her. Yeah, she was a lot of fun. Everyone loved my mom from zero years to a hundred years. People love my mom and she was known for her cakes. She was mm. from the South, like I said. So she grew up at a time when people made things from scratch and her mother was a great cook. And so she learned to love to can and all those things growing up. But she kind of left those uh, behind those habits and things, you know, people don't have time for that. And when you're working and running a business and all, but she made grits in the morning biscuits and all that fun stuff. And, wow. you know, we'd always have the, um, you know, she, her pork chops were known around wait <laughs> the a most minute. tender <laughs> fall off the bone pork chops. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Go back for a minute. What's that? You said your mom made biscuits in the oh. morning. Oh yeah, in the morning. Yeah, she made she cooked all day long because oh, my God. we went to school. So she made our breakfast and our lunch. Then my dad got up and she made his breakfast and his lunch to because she is a barber. And so to save money, she made his lunch six days a week. And wow. then um the kids came. She had the daycare kids, and so she made their breakfast, you know, oatmeal, grits, pancakes, what? whatever they were gonna what? have that day. Oh yeah. So and then my grandmother came to live with us and then she got up at a different time. So she'd make her breakfast. When my she goodness. Got up. Yeah. She, I'd say, mom, why don't you make everyone get on the same schedule? Yes. One meal. And that's what you get. No, 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 no. And she was a miracle. Then the kids she kept, if they had an accident or ruined their clothes, she would wash the clothes. I go, mom, what are you doing? Well, I know that their mother's tired. And so I just wanted oh, to send their clothes back clean. She your was mother had, she she had a beautiful, beautiful heart. Yeah. She really yeah. did. She had a heart for serving and loving people. Yeah. She I did. just know she was an amazing woman. Yeah. And I yeah. know God is like, that's one of mine. That's my girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love this about your mom. Um, when did, did she pass? She did exactly six months later. So um, she was kind of very selfless person. She hadn't, you know, how some people plan their own birthday parties. It's like, it's my birthday. We're going to have a party. But, she, you know, it wasn't a big deal for her. So this time I said, Mom, we want to give you a birthday party. So it was her 86th birthday that June. So um, she looked really good. She never looked like she had cancer. She was mm -hmm very full face and everything. She was completely beautiful, um, even though she had that uh, ailment. And so uh, her family came from far and near and to celebrate her 86th yeah. birthday. It was really sweet. And the food was good. And everyone came together to celebrate her. And then um, she didn't get sick until the doctor had recommended a procedure um, that would help her strengthen her spine. 
but it accelerated the cancers It you know, it just made it grow suddenly like, you know, it, um, and she couldn't eat or drink water uh, around August. And she's like, every time she'd wake up in the morning, she'd feel fine. And we'd start, well, let me try some fruit, like uh, strawberries or something, make her some strawberries. She'd take a few bites and then she'd say, oh, I have to go back to bed. I just can't sit up anymore. So we'd take her back to bed and that would start the day. And so it might've been, you know, something in her stomach, the cancer was in her stomach because she could not eat a thing. And so hospice was involved at that point and they would come and I'd ask them what's going on. And um, they would just record everything. Like they were, well, they were recording that, okay, she's getting closer to death. Okay. Uh huh. That's what they were doing and okay. just making her comfortable. And so it was fine, but when it got to the end, it was very uncomfortable. And um, it was disappointing for me because, you know, I thought they would be here more but they kept right. their same weekly pace. And they told me that I would have to give her the 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 um, morphine and started with every four hours. And because she got to the point where the cancer had caused a liquid to come into her lungs. And when she was in the hosp uh, hospital, they had removed the um, liquid, but as she got sicker um, and the, can the cancer was taking over, it affected her lungs the most and made it hard for her to breathe. And so um, at the end, it, I guess it's like you're drowning. And right. so, yeah, so the morphine helps you calm down. So you breathe shallow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we went from every four hours, I'd set the alarm and then uh, wake up every two hours. It went to two hours. And she had been asking her sister to come visit so the last day, it was the strangest thing that happened. I was, uh, I said, got up for the 4 a.m., you know, medication. And I was setting the alarm for 6 a.m. to wake up again to give her the next dose. But something said inside of me, don't go back to sleep. And I said, I know, but it's two hours, please. <laughs> Let me get a little bit of sleep, right? <laughs> Just have those two hours. Yeah. And said, no, don't go back to sleep. And I was like, okay. So I, she was obviously, you know, sedated. So um, I put on, pulled out my laptop and I started pecking away on the laptop. Well, it was unbelievable. Around 5.30, I would have been asleep. The power went out like that. And I said, oh my God, she was on a breathing Oh, right. Yeah. At that point, she was on oxygen to help her breathe. Um, and so the machine stopped. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, the machine stopped. What am I going to do? And I remembered that we had these canisters. They had brought mobile, like, oh, you know. OK. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I had never used it, though. So I grabbed it and I put it in and I put it in her nose. And and those. And so because of the saturation, it was dropping. And uh, so then it started going up again. I said, oh, thank God, thank God. I said, you know, your sister's coming today. Hang on, mom, your sister's coming. So um, the power was out for a while. And I thought, how long is it gonna last? Will this canister last long enough? And I called hospice and I asked them, how long does a oxygen tank last and things like that? And they were no help. They're like, well, it depends <laughs> on how much you have coming out of the tube. And I'm like, oh my God. So. Will you send someone over here to help me? Please send <laughs> right. someone to help me. And okay, yes, we will. So anyway, my neighbor was really great. I she said, Cynthia, do you need anything? My neighbors were wonderful. And I said, Well, her sister's coming. I was gonna have some food here in case. And but now what can I do? The power's out. I can't even make a pot of coffee. She said, Don't worry, I'll take care of it. And she ran to Noah's bagels and got coffee and oh, bagels and brought yeah. back to the house. So eventually her sister came and uh, the power did come on. It was only out for about three hours. So that worked out well. And her sister and family came, they had driven down from Northern California. Soon as she walked in the room, I, I said, mom, your sister's here. And you know, of course she wasn't responsive. She's a, really not aware that I could tell. And so I put her um, thing, her monitor on her finger to measure uh, because it was time to give her another dose. I said, oh, oh sorry, sister, 
I need to give her another dose of medicine. So I put that on and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh no. It was saying 89, it's not supposed to go below 100, but if you're like 90 to 100, it's okay. It said 89, 79, 69. Oh, it was dropping, dropping the oxygen level. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like, help me, help me, help me get those canisters over here. Cause the machine was pumping from the electric, mm -hmm. but I was like, we need some more air. We need some more air. And they're just looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, help me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 this isn't happening. No, no, no. And her sister was in shock and everyone's standing there. And then finally, it's, it just said nothing on the monitor on her finger. It was just zoop, nothing. And I'm like, oh my God. So that's when, you know, there was nothing else to be done. You, she, you know, as soon as her sister walked in the room, that was like, that was what she was waiting for, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. But yeah. at least her sister was there. Oh, my God. Yeah. You've been through yeah. a lot. You have been through a lot. But I can tell from your mom that she gave you so much because you wouldn't have been able to handle everything you did, you know, without that love and just her being the great person that she was, that yeah. probably made it a little bit easier for you, didn't it? It made it a little bit easier because she was such a great person. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to be there for her because yeah. she'd always been there for everyone and never really asked for anything in return, you know? So I said, well, this is the least I could do is give her some comfort, you know? And so she passed away and she looked beautiful and peaceful. And um, and so then we had to tell my dad. Oh, damn. Yeah, he was in the other room and he, you know how everyone knows something. You just have a feeling sometimes feeling. you can't. Mm -hmm. So he knew something wasn't right. And um, he kept saying, how's your mom? Where's your mom? And uh, I said, so fine. I called my brother. My brother came. And then I said, you know, um, we need to tell dad. So I told my father and well, we brought him into the room so he could feel my mom and know what was going on because he couldn't see. Right. So we told him and um, we were standing there on either side of my dad. And then he said, um, can I have a chair? So we gave brought a chair to the to bedside and um, he just sat there with her and held her hand and, you know, start to understand that she had gone and uh, then the hospice came and they called the, the, uh, yeah. yeah, the mortuary. Oh, okay. They called the mortuary and they came to pick her up. And so then that's when it was really real that, you know, they yeah. took her away. I've never had that experience, you know? And so that was, uh, that was different. Um, but it was, you know, it was, um, it was peaceful. So oh, yeah, if, and she was at home in her environment mm -hmm, because yeah. she said when she went to the hospital, if she went to the hospital, she wouldn't be able to come back home. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so funny you said that. Um, and I'll share just a little bit of my story. It's about my grandma. Um, I was going to share the, the story about my mom, but I think this story about my grandmother is so relevant. Um, I love my grandma my grandmother could not do any wrong in my <laughs> world. Okay. Everybody know I love my grandma. I am short like my grandma. I'm busted, busty like my grandma. <laughs> I love plants like my grandma. I so like my grandmother. Mm. Her father is my big daddy. We call him big daddy. And he used to tell stories all the time. So I get that from, you know, from him. And um, I remember when my grandma first um, started getting sick, my my dad, they kept telling her she needed a new doctor because she was on the same medication. She was saying for years and they was like, mama, you need to go to the doctor and you just need to get, you know, just a, a, a new doctor and everything. Sometimes I do think older people really do know things. We think we're, we're young and we know modern and all that, but sometimes, and grandma was like, no, I'm fine. So anyway, she went to the doctor. She got a new doctor. 
He took her off all the old medication. He started her on new stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, new medication and everything. And she seemed to be doing fine. Now, mm -hmm. grandma would make side comments like, yeah, that little young boy put me on all this new, on this new medication. I don't know. Just little side comments. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> my grandma was so sweet. But every now and again, you know, like a little side something she would say. Mm -hmm, that little boy, you know, talk about the doctor. Um, anyway, um, so some time passed and she started to get sick. Now, my parents were divorced. So my okay. mom, we were with my mom. So we didn't see our grandmother as much as we did when my parents were together. Um, and when my dad would pick us up, sometimes he would take us to see grandma and we would spend time with her. And I always sat and talked with her because I've mm -hmm. always had a love for sitting with older people because you learn so much. True. And what happened, grandma ended up having to go into the hospital. She was having some stomach issues. And I remember when grandma came out of the hospital, my dad had picked us up and he took us to grandmother's grandma house. And my grandmother was in the living room. I always talked to my grandma. I always sat and talked with her. And I said, grandma, what's wrong? I said, you're not yourself. Hmm. She she was quiet. My grandmother would talk and she would laugh and everything. And she was just quiet. And I said, grandma, what's wrong? You're not yourself. Now, mind you, I'm a little girl. I'm, you know, I'm young. And she said, I... um. She said nothing. I said, but grandma, where's your smile? You know mm. what? Where's your smile? You used to smile all the time. And she said, they took it from me when I went in the hospital. Oh, I have never forgotten that. And mm. I don't think anybody, this was just me and grandma talking. And yeah. I was like, well, no, grandma, they can't take your smile. You still have it. She said, they took it. They just took everything from me in the hospital. And I'm like, no, grandma, you know, I'm a little girl. I'm like, no, 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 because I want my own grandma. I want my grandma back. I want my loving, kind, telling stories, laughing grandma. Yeah. And she, she said, they, they just took it away from me. And a couple of days later, my grandma laid on the couch and she did not wake up. Mm. And my auntie found her. Oh my. I had never I and I, I I can still remember the conversations with her, but what I can say, you know, out of that, although it was sad, mm -hmm. my grandmother's life was amazing. She loved God, she loved her kids, she loved her grandchildren. She was always so loving and kind towards us. She was like your mom, you know, everybody loved her. You know, yeah. everybody liked grandma, Miss, you know, Miss Martha. People would come to her house. I mean, she was just a wonderful woman. Mm. And, you know, and I, I miss her. But like I said, when I look in the mirror sometimes, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, you see yourself in it. So yeah. I think parents with our, you know, with your parents and your grandparents and all that, it I think it's so wonderful when you can see the beauty in them you can see mm. the love in them yeah. and you can see how much people love them and how much yeah. people adore them and want to be it makes you a better person because i'm telling you my grandmother was again she could do no wrong in my eyesight don't talk bad about her if you're going to talk bad about her, going somewhere else because it's going to turn ugly <laughs> it's going to turn <laughs> ugly if you talk about my grandmother but and I know you you told me a little bit about your dad and your dad. Um, I'm sure he took it really hard. But did he get it? Because I know you shared with me when we did our meet and greet a little bit about yeah. your dad. Yeah, um, he did understand uh, what happened, but he would forget. And okay. so, um, yeah, he was he would say, um, you know, he'd ask for her. Or he would think when well, as I walked through the house, he would call her name and I'd say, no, it's me, dad, Cynthia. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. And so um, then when we went to like, um, you know, the, the mortuary to make the preparations of the, all of that. And so he went and, you know, he didn't really understand, you know, why, why we were there. Um, so I had to remind him because we had buried his mother there. So he thought we were there about her. 
And I said, no, mom passed away. So he, he would have moments where he would think she was still here. And so that was difficult for him. And so usually when people have dementia and they're something changes, drastic change, they don't do well with change. And so mm -hmm. it was it's difficult true. for him. So he missed her terribly. He loved her so much. And so um, he passed shortly afterwards. Um, yeah, he was having challenges. And so the um, it's like sundowning. And so like I'd get him ready for uh, bed. And then he a um, couple hours later, he'd uh, come back in the room, the, the dining room, and um, he'd have dressed and put his day clothes on again. <laughs> <laughs> so just like dad no it's nighttime but he didn't know he doesn't know right. night and night after day. a short nap he felt rested like he had been you know slept for several hours so he'd say you know is what's it what's to eat and I'm like uh just did the dishes <laughs> yeah. so really it was really challenging but it was really nice too because his although his short-term memory wasn't available off as often as needed his long-term memory seemed like got keener and keener. Yeah. And so I had a lot of great conversations with him about the past. So mm. like, for example, this house they bought in 1964. And I said, how'd you find this house, dad? And he could tell me everything about wow. the that they, the other houses that they saw before they decided on this one. And, um, he was a barber and so he could talk about hairstyles from the 60s um mm. you know they had names for the guys hairstyles I forgot what they're called <laughs> but, <laughs> but he could talk all about it and he remembered so many things that it was nice to go back in time so now my uncle my mom's brother I visit with him because it really keeps my memories alive of my mom and dad because he can tell me stories about the family and the funny things my mom said and, um, you know, just things that I didn't even know about her growing up as a kid. So I spent a lot of time and he just called me right before this. He goes, I want you to know I'm in New Orleans. I said, oh, because they have a sibling in New Orleans. I said, oh, yeah. He goes, yeah, my plane just landed. I just want you to know I'll be here for a couple of days. So um, uh, I think so um, my mom was the the second born and mm -hmm. she passed. So he's visiting the eldest sister and he's the eldest brother and okay. the youngest brother passed away. So, um, so there's five all together and three remaining yeah. two girls. And let's see, one, two. Yeah. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Two girls and my uncle. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Listen, I got you beat. My mother is number 22 <laughs> of 22. So <laughs> I got you beat, beat. And what's so amazing about that is my dad is number three out of 11. So he was with the older ones and mama is with the younger ones, which is uh, wow. every time, I, every time I tell somebody that I get the same reactions, it's like, what? So oh. some of her siblings had grown and moved on, you yeah. know, it was like two sets of children yeah. with it. So, and I, yeah. <laughs> but you know I want to lighten it up a little bit because you know we've been talking about you know sad things but I'm I'm telling you although your parents have passed they raised yeah. a beautiful daughter you know and that's what's most important that they raise you and your siblings to be great people you know they've done their job what their job yeah. was on earth you know mm. to do that but I want to um you know, we've been talking about our parents and where I've talked a little bit about my grandmother. But since you've been through the loss of both of your parents, there's two things I want um, advice I want to ask you to give to my listeners. The first okay. is about, you know, the personal side of it. You know, mom, my mom, my dad, they're passing. How did you get through it? And then the second thing I want you to know is financially, what advice would you give someone who has parents, you know, older parents, or is there anything that should be put in place, you know, when you first find out that they're sick? So yeah. you can answer the first one and then I'll re-ask the second one. So being that the personal side, how did you get through the, the loss of both of your parents, you know, and 
you're yeah. thriving and you're, you know, being the beautiful Cynthia that you are. Yeah. Well, first I know that we talked about it. Um, you know, it's a conversation that was, it's uncomfortable, but there was a comfort in it because it's going to happen. Right. Um, so we would talk about it and my mom would ask me, are you going to cry? And I said, no, mom, I'm not going to cry. Oh, you're cold hearted. She said, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just know that I'll see them again. And they, I know that they live in my heart. So if I live right, then they're still here. Oh, so I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I called her friends because I look like her and, and people say I sound like her because we were mm. together a lot. We're, we're very close, but I call her friends and I say, hi, Mrs. Coffee. Hi, Miss So-and-so. Hi, auntie, this one, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm so glad to hear from you. I know you how busy you are. It means a lot to hear from you and all of that. So I, I do that. And I just try to, you know, keep some of those memories alive and friendships with people. She was a great cook. And so she asked to, you know, give her recipes out to some people and things like that. But mostly I just, you know, I knew it was coming and I, I have a strong belief that um, you know, there's part of them is with me and lives, you know, by me doing right and living well. And then Annette, I know when my time comes that, you know, we'll be reunited. Yeah. Oh, see, I like that. Yeah. Um, for me, well, both my parents are still here, but for my grandparents and my grandma, especially my grandma and my big dad, her father, you know, I, that one of the things I do on my podcast, um, before I start having guests, I used to share personal stories and mm -hmm. I talked about my grandmother. I talked about my, my big daddy. I talk about them a lot and that keeps them alive. And yeah. when I'm over, when I'm plant doing watering my plants or when I'm sewing and making something, I remember her. So her memory is always there. And like you said, just talking to people who knew them. Yeah. Or, but when I look in the mirror, I'm like, mm -hmm. that's, that's Martha's grandbaby right there. Because it, mm -hmm. I was doing something. I was like, oh my God, I am so my grandma. I am so my grandmother. So she's always with me. So, yeah. um, for the financial part, you know, or <laughs> what, what advice would you give someone, you know, if you all of a sudden, you know, a parent, um, get sick and, and you're not quite prepared. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think it's important to prepare. I have a law background. I graduated from law school many years ago. And so um, when I learned about um, estate planning, mm -hmm. I suggested that they take up and look into getting a state plan. And so most people don't have a plan uh, or they don't think they have a plan, but the plan is what the government has in place, the laws of your state will outline how money and property will be distributed according to the code. Um, but if you set your own plans, then you need to work with the lawyer that everything's done properly and according laws change. So they have to be updated as well. So my parents had one done many years ago, which had to be updated. And, um, and so that was really something that was important. And I was vigilant about. Uh, so talking to people and really telling them what you want. Uh, uh, so I talked to my mom about like what kind of funeral she wanted. Okay. So they had beautiful services because they were very clear about what they wanted that to look like. And then um, as they're uh, in good health, it's still important to have certain documents in order in case of emergency. Like um, my parents had me as their um, health advocate so just with the doctor's office, you know, to be able to call the doctor and speak on their behalf or get information about their health is uh, important as well. And so um, along the way, because my dad's health had been poor, it was a common thing for us to make those, to make myself known to the physicians. And they were always glad to, you know, have um, the involvement. And so doctors, you know, if you have a good doctor, I don't know if all of them like it, but my experience is that the doctors, they did like that the, you know, families mm -hmm. involved in that situation, but make sure those paperwork are in order. So like a power of attorney, 
for financial, but it's very specific. You know, it could be related to a specific bank account or so um, one of my friends, they're, they're being proactive in their family. There's a, the eldest daughter and two younger sibling. And so the mother um, said, you know, I'm going to put you on the house and different the bank accounts. So it makes it easier. But if there's no comfort level, like my friend's very stable financially, but if that's not the case, it could be a problem for the parent that's needing assistance. So then in that case, just a power of attorney speaking to how things would be handled in the event that they need to you know, address financial matters because it's very difficult to go to the bank and have transactions done because of all the scams and different things happening. Yeah. You have to have your paperwork pristine when you go to, um, and it takes time to have those documents updated. So when my mother passed and I was trying to work with the account um, and her name was on there and I had the power of attorney for my dad, for example, it I needed to do something, but I couldn't because they said, well, first we have to take your mother off. So did you bring her death certificate? No, because oh. I was coming about my dad. Okay, well, you know, e scan and send that to me. We first we need to take handle step by step. So that adds two, three, four days, and you're trying to move money around. That's can be a problem. Two or three, four, five days, but we got it done. So just planning ahead, you know, power of attorney mm -hmm. for financial matters, the healthcare document with the physician, um, those two things you want to have estate planning to uh, protect and make it easier. The probate is very expensive at least in California. I don't know how it is in other places, but the probate process involves getting a judge involved. So you file the papers oh. and then they have to set dates and just make sure that things are done in an orderly manner. And so if you have an estate plan, you bypass that probate process. Right. So that's the beauty of that, but it's expensive. So you have to have something to protect to make that worthwhile. Nevertheless, the point is, do whatever planning you can, but those two preliminary documents are are vital in the beginning. Have open conversations, so at least you know what the person will want. Because they ask me over and over again, do you, you know the directive resuscitation? That's one of the questions mm, that comes up yeah. a lot. Do they Advanced, want yeah. any extraordinary measures? That type of thing. Advanced directive. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God, this is so good. It's it's so good. I'm I'm so glad that you know we chose to talk about this particular subject, um, because um, like my mom, you know, we found out that she was sick, and I knew about two things, two of the things that you said. Getting metal. Well, I have medical power of attorney over my mom, okay. and then just have the other. What was the other one you you said? Just power of attorney. Yeah, for finances. For finances. And so my brother took that on um, because he was already helping her with her finances and all that. But I think one of the things that you said is so key, the earlier you start, it, the better. Because we did not do anything until we found out she was sick. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. because you know she was independent she was doing everything on her own you know we didn't know until we my brother went over and found out that some um bills hadn't been paid and that's how we found out I was like well what's going on you know something is going on so I think it's very key that you start as early as you can I did things from the internet because I just did not know so mm -hmm. I went on the internet, you know, and did my research to figure out what we needed to do. Besides yeah. the in the internet, is there someone in in particular that you should go to, or is that a good resource? I think that, uh, like, say, so what I did, for example, I started researching, like you described, trying to get answers for myself because I think aging is different for our generation than it was in the past. Okay. So for example, um, you know, not knowing what are run scenarios. So I just run different scenarios. So one of the things I did was that what if they got to the point where they couldn't manage themselves at home? That's one scenario okay. because we were working with the plan that they're independent, but what if they become less independent? Uh, so then 
what would that look like? And so I started visiting um, senior homes, places where, you know, like it's called um, Sunrise was one of them, $10,000 a month. And yes. just understanding what that fee would look like. So that's educating yourself and they're super friendly and you can have conversations and based on what you say, they can make recommendations for you, your learning of that process. Um, AARP is a great, oh, great okay. research. They've, they've done research and that's their business is elder, right? Senior population. So you can go to their website and get volumes and volumes of information and support groups and things like that. Look for, so when I went to take that tour, um, I found out that they had a, a program on dementia. So I would go to the monthly meeting where people were talking about um, caring for someone with dementia. And so I would recommend before you get into the position and you're just thrown into the deep end mm -hmm. of being a caregiver, start joining a Facebook group or a group in your community on meetup or something that they're talking about caregiving. So you can learn how to prepare for that because um, when you're a caregiver, it's a really encompassing role. And so you put yourself on the back burner. You're not getting the sleep when you're waking up every four hour, every two hours. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so that's the first thing is your own health and really have a system that you can work with your health and maintaining your sleep and your rest, um, setting up a team before in advance. So when it comes, it's like, okay, it's just having that conversation. If something were to happen to my mom or my dad, whatever the case is in your family, who can help? Who can give me a relief? You know, like, so yeah. that's what happened with me. My cousins, they said, you know, uh, everyone can't do it. They live way far or they have kids and their own responsibilities with grandchildren and all of that. But two of my cousins were really great. They stepped up to the plate and said, you know, we got to just let us know. Um, there was a lady down the street. She said she loved my mom. She had helped her in through the years, 30 years friendship. She said, I don't care what time it is. You call me. And I could call her at two in the morning and say, mom needs help. Can you come? And she leave and come over immediately. Luckily, she just lived two blocks away. But those are, I create a support system of people that yeah. I could call and they could help out. Um, so it was really great. Uh, another thing, my mother wasn't able to ride uh, in the car any longer with the wheelchair and all of that. So we ordered a um, non-emergency medical transport. transport so we, yeah. I found a um, African-American a black owned business. And so I became really good friends with them. And so, you know, they have rules like mm. whatever, but they didn't apply to us. <laughs> I'd say, oh, I know it's last minute, but can you, you know, I had the driver's number, he'd go get one of the vans and he'd come over and yeah. all of that kind of thing. It was just really special. But if you treat people well and mm -hmm. throughout your life, so bottom line, whatever you do, it it's uh, someone's keeping a record somewhere. Karma yep. is coming back. It's coming you back give, to you. Right. You get. And I'm telling you, I am a witness. If you want a good life from now to the end, treat people right. Absolutely. Your insurance I, policy, treat people right. Yes. Ooh, listen to you doing a commercial at the end. Treat <laughs> people right. I love it. I love it. This has been so good. And I thank you for, you know, sharing with my audience, you know, giving them good advice because you don't think about it until something happens. But yeah. the key to everything that you just said is you need to prepare early and yeah. knowledge is power. Just yes. going and just learning and just trying to fit because we were thrown into it. And I have to tell you, it was very, it, it has been very difficult and just trying, it was during the pandemic at the beginning of the pandemic. Ooh, so things were, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm still sitting here doing interviews and all that. So that's good things coming back when you give out. It yes. does come back to you. Yes. So thank you so much, Cynthia. So if anyone has any questions about, um, you know, um, what is real estate, not real estate, what is it? Oh, tax lien investing. Investing, yes. If anyone has any questions about that, 
you know, tell us where we can find you so that we can get some information and get some questions answered. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I have my group pages on Facebook. So that's uh, Tax Lean Mastermind. If you just put Tax Lean Mastermind in the search for the Facebook, it'll come up. And so you can see some videos that I have there talking about what are tax liens and, okay. um, and all that good stuff. So yeah, just check me out there and um, we'll put the other captions in below in the comments. Okay. Yes, I will make sure <laughs> that I put them in the notes so that people will be able to find you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, you know, and thank you for being so open and sharing your story with us about your mom and your dad. Um, I really do appreciate it. You know, like I said, I love stories and I love sharing yeah. stories because stories help. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, um, it was a pleasure for sure. I enjoy learning about you and your family too. We have a lot in common. We do. All yeah. Right.